This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. So equity law, it grew from the deficiencies of common law. As anything that becomes commonized, it becomes more obvious what is missing. If, if it's disparate, if it's dispersed, if it's a diaspora of, of, of law, then oh, it's only when you bring it all together do you realize that, that there are deficiencies, there are gaps, there are holes uh, in the law. And so equity and the courts of equity began to fill those gaps because in the absence of damages, there was nothing else. If you were not able to, to claim damages, if damages was not sufficient, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> you have to do without your, your ancient dynasty Chinese vase. So in 14th century, 14th, 1300, 12, 58, 13 something, came Iquitus and the Chancellor's Court. The early 17th century, I think it was, again, don't remember the dates, but 16, I think 1604 is in my mind. I'm saying it only to show you that we're looking at a piece of legislation which is what, uh, when are we now, 20, it's 400 and some years old. It, and, and, and it's... <laughs> The cornerstones, one of the cornerstones of, of the English legal system. And it stood the test of time. So the Earl of Oxford's case, the Earl of Oxford's case was, um, remember there's no public purse in, in the uh, early 17th century. There's no concept of paying money in. The, the king used to collect money, but that was just basically for the king. Um, but so there's no concept of civil servants and people being paid out of the public purse, no police force, of course, uh, until that famous Berry politician Robert Peel uh, created the, the police force uh, as it now developed and as we now know it. So um, there's no common person, and these judges and barons are giving up their time to hear local cases, and they would be compensated, would be paid by the um, the people in the case, the plaintiff would pay an amount, the defendant would pay an amount, and, and the case would be heard. So it was really dependent upon the ability of these people to pay money, uh, how much the judge, the baron, the local lord, landowner, was presiding over the case, how much they could earn. And of course, when a case came involving the Earl of Oxford, that was a very lucrative one. So the Lord Chief Justice, who was the head of the Common Law Courts, and the Lord Chancellor, who was the head of the Chancellor Courts, the Chancellor's Courts, they actually came to blows. They came to blows and, and said, I want Oxford's case. Oxford's case is mine. And the Lord Chief Justice said, no, 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 no. this is a, a, a case belonging to common law. It's not a it's, it's damages case. It's not a, an equitable case. And they came to blows. And the king, riding past on a, a hunting expedition, saw... Two men fighting in the valley below, and, and he wrote down, says, I'll, I'll step in and show these commoners what a good king I am. And he, and can you imagine his surprise when he sees these two bare-chested men with wigs on, the Lord Chief Justice and Lord Chancellor, hitting each other? They leapt off his horse and separated them and said, come on, what's the problem here? The Lord Chief Justice said, let me at him, let me at him. He wants to hear Oxford's case, and it's my case. And the Chancellor said, it's my case. I said, it's equitable, it's not damages. The king holding these two apart looked from one to the other, and this, this is crucial, this is amazing. He looked from one to the other and said, in the event of a dispute as to who shall hear a case, equity shall have the last word. The Lord Chancellor shall have the last word. And that decision by the king in the early part of the 17th century has shaped and moulded the direction in which English law has subsequently gone for the last 413 or so years. That's amazing. So equity shall prevail. Equity shall have the last word. And that was confirmed, it was put into statute back in 1873-75. And these are the main remedies which are available under the principles of equity. The principles of the, the, the decisions or the award of specific performance and specific performance always reminds me of, of Nike and the advert for Nike because specific performance is do it, just do it. So there I am trying to buy a, a vase and damages is insufficient and it goes to court, they take, take, take the case to court. 
and the court looks at the person who's holding this vase and says, transfer that vase, give that vase over to Mike. Now, I would be sorely tempted if I were giving that vase and having to give that vase, I would be sorely tempted as I'm handing it over to drop it, so that if I can't have it, I don't see why anybody else should have it. But that, that's, the, that's the principle, specific performance, do it. Nike, just do it. Injunction, on the other hand, is stop it. Whatever it is you're doing, stop it. That's an injunction. You don't find your neighbour is playing Beyonce into the early hours of every morning, not, not switching off until four o'clock and you're being kept awake by this noise, this racket. And then she's up again at nine o'clock the following morning, disturbing you, just got to sleep, didn't you, at seven o'clock eventually, and nine o'clock you're woken up again by Beyonce wobbling away. And she's become a public nuisance as your neighbour. So you can go to court and the court will... Probably they will send a noise abatement officer around from the local council and they will listen and record and take measurements and then we'll go back to court and the court will say, yeah, this is a, a nuisance, this is this is a wrong, this is a tort. It's a, we'll, we'll come to tort later, but nuisance is a tort. And this neighbour of yours and Beyonce is guilty of a tortious act of nuisance and so the court will say, stop it. And that's an example of an injunction. Recession. Recession always reminds me of Superman. And do you remember the Superman film where Lois Lane is in the car and the car's run out of petrol and, and the San Andreas fault is opening up and Superman has had to go and, and rescue Miss, Mrs. Somebody or other in Hackensack, New Jersey. And this is just rescuing her by diverting the nuclear weapon up into the sky. He hears from 3,000 miles away, he hears Lois as she's slowly buried and the, the stuff comes back over and covers her car and she's suffocating and, and he hears her last gasp, Superman, Superman. And he gets there and he's standing by the car and Lois is there, dead. And he breaks all the rules that his father had said, you don't interfere. And he shot up, do you remember? He shot up into the sky and he reached up and he started spinning around, around the world, turning time backwards. And the globe spun backwards against itself on this wrong axis. And the San Andreas fault opened up again and the car came out and, and Superman landed. And Lois was saved. Well, that is recession. Turning time backwards. The court says you've been led into the situation where you've been, as a result of a misrepresentation, you've now entered into a situation, you discovered that the representation that led you into this position was false, it was a misrepresentation, and we are able to take time backwards and put you back into your pre-contractual position. We will put you back and restore you to the situation you were in before you were affected by this wrong representation. That's recession, turning time backwards and restoring the innocent party to their, their previous position. Rectification is to rectify. There is a case about the sale of rifles and there were a hundred rifles that were the possible subject of the contract and one uh, email said when sent away after a series of correspondence and a hundred rifles have been mentioned but so also had three rifles been mentioned and the, the the one who was wanting to buy some only wanted to buy three but when they sent their, their message when they typed up their agreement to a contract instead of three they wrote the and so it was there they are in a case of selling a hundred rifles and they didn't want a hundred, they only wanted three, but they were able to prove that the seller had previously known that they were talking only about three. And even though it was written that yes, we agreed to buy the rifles instead of three rifles, the court rectified that mistake and said, no, no, strike out the, put in three, now go ahead with your contract. So rectification, the four 
main, therefore, and two primary ones, with specific performance and injunction, more re prevalent than rescission and rectification. But those are they. That's how the courts, the Chancellor's courts, came up with new remedies, which are rather different, obviously, from the remedy of damages. Remedies, these remedies, specific performance and so on, these are equitable remedies, are given at the court's discretion. You can't go and ask for them. So you plead your case as a plaintiff, you plead your case, and the defendant defends themselves, hopefully without any sound argument, and the court listens to both sides, and eventually the court says, well, yeah, I think you're right, but I don't think it's going to be a sensible remedy for me to award you damages. So instead I have available to me the possibility of awarding equitable remedies. And so I'm going to say to you, stop it, or you do it. And, and that will be uh, the court's reaction where damages is not sufficient. Ratio, I mentioned earlier, is the rationale for the decision, and it's distinct and separate from overture. And ratio is really important. It's the fundamental reason why this earlier judge has reached the decision. Now, just think about the timeline here. There is no assume. There is no precedent involved. And I've already said that judicial precedent is the cornerstone of English law. But in this particular instance, there is no precedent available. So a judge is hearing a case, and they think, well, uh, no precedent is available, so I'm in the situation of having to create innovative law. And it happens occasionally nowadays. For instance, any legal dispute about surrogacy and surrogate mothers. It happens about uh, LGBT, because the first cases of LGBT were found one way, but then as, as society's acceptance slowly changed over a period of time, we had to move, and the judges and the courts had to move with those times, and so they had to create new decisions, sometimes against previous decisions. But Ratio Decidendi says, we will rely on earlier decisions. Now, I started off, if there isn't an earlier decision, you make a decision. The second time a similar case is heard, it's the legal representatives of the plaintiff and the defendant who are then going to say, look, Your Honour, Judge, the facts of this case are remarkably similar to the facts of a, a previous case heard just last year, and this is the decision, and that was the ratio, and the defence is saying, no, 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 that wasn't the ratio at all, the ratio was something different. So it's a second case which tries to identify the ratio, it's not the judge. The judge doesn't sit there, first one, in the, the first case, doesn't sit there in his week-long summary and say, blah, 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 what I'm about to say now is the ratio and everything else is obiter. No, no. It's the second case where the plaintiff's legal representatives and the, and the defendant's legal representatives are arguing as to what was the bit from the previous case, which was the ratio. And whichever one it was, then the second case is then decided. So it's the judge in the second case that determines what was the ratio of the first case. And then the third case comes along and says, Your Honour, this is a case similar to the second one. This is a case similar to that second case from four years ago. And in that case, it was established that the ratio in this situation was from the earlier case, the first case. It was from the earlier one. And this was the ratio. And now we're bound. We have to follow that ratio because... That's how English law works. Once a decision has been reached in court, then that decision is binding on subsequent judges hearing subsequent cases in subsequent courts. And that's the, that's the cornerstone. That's the building block upon which everything is then based. And it's only when something new comes along we have to create a new building block. But it builds up from there. And it's consistent. And it gives certainty. And it gives predictability to an extent. It gives predictability. And so ratio decidendi, really important and clearly distinct from obiter dicta. So it's binding on future judges in similar cases. But then we have these three things. We have reversing, overruling and distinguishing. A decision is reached 
in the High Court. But the loser is not happy, so he appeals that to the Court of Appeal, or maybe even leapfrogs the Court of Appeal and moves into the Supreme Court, what used to be called the House of Lords, the Supreme Court in England and Wales. So this decision is reached in the High Court. The loser appeals it, and the judge in the appeal court is not bound by High Court previous decisions. So the ratio of a High Court decision does not bind the, the, the Court of Appeal judges. And incidentally, the decision of Court of Appeal judges does not bind the Supreme Court judges. They're bound themselves by their own decisions, and High Court are bound by their own decision. High Court are bound by that separate Court of Appeal, are bound by their own decision. High Court, bound by their own earlier decisions. So, along we go, we've got the High Court judge bound by a previous High Court decision. We go higher to the next Court of Appeal level, and the Court of Appeal looks at the High Court's decision and says, no. We think that's wrong, we're going to reverse it. So it's a higher court, same case. Overruling is again the concept of higher court, so we're in Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal is looking at an earlier decision from the High Court and says, no, we're going to overrule that earlier decision from the High Court. Not the same case, different case. And so reversing the same case, higher court, Overruling, different case, higher court. Distinguishing is where a judge, for instance, in the high court, will distinguish the, the, the facts of the case in front of him from earlier cases which establish the ratio. So distinguishing is saying, I'm not bound by that ratio because the facts are not close enough to the facts and the similarity of the case that I'm now hearing. They don't have to be exact. Similar is, is close enough, near enough is close enough. It's not binding, right? it's not binding if it's too obscure. If it's made per incurium without, without care, without taking into account all the facts available. It's not binding if it's in conflict with a basic principle of law. There are basic principles like thou shalt not, but not necessarily biblical principles. But if, it, if the, the, the decision is contrary to basic principles of law, then the ratio is not binding. And in fact, it would be likely overruled. I'm, I'm struggling with this next one because as a result of Brexit, ratio is not binding, it's in conflict with European law. But as a result of Brexit, I'm wondering how much longer that is going to apply. Whether uh, a free, independent and misguided England, UK, is going to be um, still cognizant and aware of and follow European law. Interesting. I don't know. I do, that has to be resolved, I presume. It's not binding, it's too wide. And if it's not binding, it's made in an inferior court, which I've already told you about. If it's a decision in the High Court, it's binding on other later High Court judges. But it's not binding on Court of Appeal, not binding on the Supreme Court judges. And Court of Appeal decisions are not binding on House of Lords, sorry, Supreme Court decisions.